We are for the church and for the kingdom. This vision drives everything we do. There are many noble causes and institutions in this world, and we care about the future of seminaries, academies, governments, social causes, and parachurch ministries, but they are not fundamentally why we exist. We exist for the future of the church and the advancement of God's kingdom. With God's help, our students today will be the pastors, ministers, and missionaries of the global church tomorrow. We teach the Bible in the classroom so that generations of churches will be sturdy outposts of Christ's kingdom. This is how we serve the church, and this is how we bless every other good and noble endeavor until God's glory covers the earth like the waters cover the sea. Will you join us? Would you get your copy of the Sacred Scriptures and be turning with me to Luke chapter 5? Let me breathe a word of prayer, asking God's blessings on our time together, and then I want you to hear the reading of God's word from Luke chapter 5. Our Father in heaven, what a privilege it is to address you as our Father in heaven because of the blood and righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is in his name we pray that you would cause our worship to go higher as you deepen our understanding of your word. Open our eyes that we may behold wondrous things from your word. Give us understanding and we will obey your word and keep it with our whole heart in Jesus' name. Amen. Luke chapter 5, beginning at verse 1. On one occasion, while the crowds were pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, and he saw two boats by the lake, but the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. Getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, he asked him to put out a little from the land, and he sat down and taught the people from the boat. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we toiled all night and took nothing, but at your word I will let down the nets. And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish, and their nets were breaking. They signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me. For I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, do not be afraid, for from now on you will be catching men. And when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. Amen. I want to label the message, the life Jesus uses. The life Jesus uses. In the church I grew up in, Deacon Max Smith would often sing his favorite hymn, Use me, Lord, in thy service. Draw me nearer every day. Lord, I'm willing to run on all the way. And if I stumble while I'm trying, don't be angry, let me stay. Lord, I am willing to run on all the way. That's a good prayer. Use me, Lord. But I commend this morning, it may not be the best way to pray. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10 makes it clear, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works that God foreordained, preordained that we should walk in them. Friends, God saved you that he might use you. God is sanctifying you that he might use you. God has sustained you thus far in spite of life's dangers, toils, and snares that he may use you. God supplies all of your needs so that he may use 
you. God strengthens you in your weakness that he may use you. John 15, verse 8, Jesus says, By this is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. The entirety of the Christian life is sovereignly and strategically and specifically designed so that you might live and serve for the glory of God and the good of others. And so, yes, it is good to pray, Lord, use me. But I submit it is better to pray, Lord, make me usable. That's the question on the table this morning. Are you usable? That big question is what confronts us, I believe, when we read Luke chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. On, on a cursory reading of the text, it seems as if this is a story about Peter. It is not. This text is not about Peter. It is about Jesus. There is a important lesson here about the person of the Lord Jesus Christ in this narrative. On one hand, we see a reminder that of the humanity of Christ. Jesus was a man. He was a real man. He was a man's man. On Sundays after church, I get in the car and say to my wife, find me another pulpit to preach. And then when we get home, I sit on the couch and pass out. <laughs> and she wakes me up and says, get out of that suit, Mr. Charles, and go to bed. Not Jesus. Jesus preached to a large crowd in this text for an extended period in an open air setting and then finishes by saying to Peter, let's go fishing. Jesus was a man. <laughs> but, but he was more than a man. David Gooding says, here was the Lord of fish and fishermen, the Lord of nature, the Lord of men and their daily work. In verse 4, Jesus says to Peter, put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. In a real sense, this is how it feels. That expression states how it feels to read through this story for the first time. It begins in shallow water, if you will. Just a cursory reference to Jesus preaching to a crowd. Incidentally, he's preaching from a boat. You don't know where this story is going. But from there, you get into deeper water where Jesus performs a miracle on the behalf of these fishermen who have toiled all night and caught nothing. And then by the end of the story, after turning these fishermen's failure into success, they leave everything behind to become full-time followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. The fishermen become fishers of men. And this increasingly dramatic story teaches us the life Jesus uses. Simply, nothing profound. I simply just want to remind us today, Jesus uses the usable. Jesus uses people who are usable people. And so the question I want us to consider as we read through this text is, what does it take to be usable for the Lord? Three answers I want you to see. First, consider that Jesus uses available people. Jesus uses available people. Daryl Bach comments that sometimes service for Jesus starts out rather innocently. This narrative is a great illustration of that truth. In this text, a miracle takes place. But this story is not about the miracle. This is a call narrative. In this text, Jesus will call 
Peter and his fishing partners, James and John, into full-time discipleship. In fact, that's not just in a sense the point of this narrative. It's the point of the chapter later in verses 27 and 28. He will call Levi from his tax collecting business into full-time discipleship. This is a call narrative. But it begins in such a seemingly random fashion. Verse 1 just says, on one occasion... While the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret. (laughs) It was some seemingly random occasion, and a large crowd was pressing in on Jesus. They are pushing and shoving, trying their best to get as close to Jesus as they can. But Luke tells us this crowd is not there to witness a miracle. They want to hear the word of God. Preaching the word of God was the primary ministry of Jesus. In Luke chapter 4, verses 18 and 19, he declares in the synagogue in Nazareth, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. This crowd showed up at the Lake of Gennesaret, the Sea of Tiberias, or the Sea of Galilee. They pressed in on Jesus at the banks of this sea to hear the word of God. They are so unlike contemporary, quote, unquote, worshipers who need in some instances in their mind, a perfect environment before they can worship right. This is a crowd that did not go home or stay home because the venue was uncomfortable and Jesus was not like uh, contemporary high-profile religious personalities that have to have a conducive setting before he can minister. There at the banks of the river, Jesus proclaimed the word of God. He says in verse 43, the end of chapter 4, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God. And so here we find Jesus responding to the, the crowd's desire to hear his word. Verse 2 says, He saw two boats by the lake, but the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. He saw more than boats. Friends, he saw an opportunity. So verse 3 says, getting into one of the boats, which was Simon, he asked him to put out a little from the land, and he sat down and taught the people from the boat. What What an experience that must have been. Jesus preaching to the crowd from the boat. The boat was his pulpit. The seashore was his amphitheater. The water was his PA system. And from there, Jesus preached and taught the crowd. Alfred Plummer says Christ uses Peter's boat as a pulpit from whence he throws out the net of the gospel over his hearers. But what I want you to see in the first movement of this message is simply that the Lord did not commandeer Peter's boat that day. Verse number three specifically says, he asked him to put out from the land. Simon consented to permit Jesus to use his boat. That may seem like a small detail, but I submit to you, friends, that's the starting point of Christian discipleship. It's the starting point of Christian ministry. It's the starting point of Christian usefulness. There is a large crowd that hears Jesus that day, but we are not told that any in the crowd become disciples. We are told that this one that makes his boat available to Jesus becomes a disciple. At the end of the story, Simon will leave everything to follow Jesus. But that would have never happened at the end of the story if at the beginning of the story, he did not make his boat available to Jesus. 
Often when this passage is preached, we put emphasis on the command, put out and launch into the deep and let down your nets for catch. But that's not the first instruction. The first is put out a little from the land so that the Lord could use that boat as a pulpit. I hope this is not too simple for a deep seminary setting, but I just want to ask, is the Lord asking you to make something in your life available to him? I'm tempted to spend time listing out the possibilities of what that might be. I'm going to resist that temptation because if I do, I might leave yours out. But may God, the Holy Spirit, tap you on the shoulder and impress upon you that thing in your life that the Lord is saying, you need to submit this to me. You need to make this available to me. Whatever it is, whatever that quote unquote boat is in your life that the Lord is asking to use, friend, tell him yes. If you tell him yes, he will use it and bless you. The Lord uses available people. Secondly, would you consider with me that the Lord uses obedient people? The Lord uses available people, but the Lord also uses Obedient people. Verses one through three is about the Lord's encounter with the crowd. But now in verses four through seven, the focus shifts from the crowd to Simon Peter. And we see in the middle section of this text that the Lord uses obedient people. We first see the cost of obedience. The cost of obedience at the heart of the text are two radical acts. It begins with a radical command in verse number four. And when he had finished preaching, he said to Simon, put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. In the real sense, after the service was over and Jesus had spent that extended time ministering the word, he now says, let's go fishing. But it's the wrong time to go fishing. The men would fish at night. During the day, because of the heat, the the fish would go into deeper water or the net might become more obvious on the surface. Men typically fished at night. This was the wrong time to go fishing. But Jesus says, I don't tell time the way you tell time. The fact that you think it's a bad time is not a factor to me. Let's go fishing. And he guarantees they will not fish in futility. He says, if you do what I command, I guarantee you'll catch something. Let's not just go out there and throw out a line. Put out so that we will catch something. This is the challenge of faith. When the Lord calls on us to do something that does not make sense. Michael Wilcox comments here, as long as Simon's boat is being used for a pulpit, the owner has no objection to Jesus saying in it what he likes. But when it becomes a fishing boat again, it is Simon's once more. And Jesus no longer has a say in how it is to be used. Fishing is Simon's business. What do you do? When the Lord calls on you to do something that doesn't seem to make sense. See in the text that we go from a radical command to radical obedience. In verse 5, he says to Jesus, Master, Lord, you're the one in charge. (laughs) You know, uh, in my life, uh, I desire and dream to be the noble apostle Paul. Then I read stories like this and then reminded afresh how much I'm just like Peter. Lord, master, you're the one in charge. Now let me tell you why what you're telling me is not a good idea. Master, we have toiled all the night. That little word has big implications. It's, it's not just 
talking about activity. It is a statement about the effects of the activity. This was strenuous manual labor, casting the net, drawing the net. They had been at it all night and were physically exhausted. They were out of gas. They were wiped out. We have been toiling all the night and we have caught nothing. It is not that we didn't, we weren't as productive as we hoped we would have been last night. This has been an abject failure. We have been totally unsuccessful. It would have been okay if we would have caught a little. We have caught nothing. He states the facts, but then he expresses his faith. What a statement. But at your word, I will let down the nets. <laughs> the church I grew up in wasn't uh, King James only, but we only use King James, if you know what I mean. And so I still got a lot of that in my system. And there the text says, nevertheless, I like that. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the nets. Nevertheless, I know how things look. I know how things feel. I know how things seem. But nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the nets. This, in fact, is the language of Jesus. Later on in Luke twenty-two forty-two, in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus will pray to the Father. If it is possible, let this cup pass away from me. But nevertheless... Not my will, but thy will be done. Let me put a footnote here, friend, and say that you are just playing at prayer. If at the end of your prayer, you cannot sincerely say with Jesus, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. Lord, at your word. If the Lord is going to use your life in service for him, You've got to have this nevertheless faith at your word. You've got to, if I may say it this way, you've got to let his word be the last word. You are going out into an increasingly hostile culture against all the things of the word of God. And the world will eat you alive if you don't have the conviction of the authority of scripture that submits to it Above the opinions of man, you will only be usable to the Lord if you have nevertheless faith at your word. Let me give you some advice. It's stolen advice. It's John 2, 5, where Mary gives the best advice anyone can ever give anyone. When she tells the servants at the wedding in Cana of Galilee, whatever he tells you to do, do it. Whatever he tells you to do, do it. And so we see, on one hand, the cost of obedience, but would you consider as well with me the consequences of obedience? Leon Morris comments here that Peter might not agree, but he can obey. And we see what happens when he obeys. The Lord breaks his nets. When he obeyed, when he did what the Lord says, verse six, when he had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish and their nets were breaking. This is Luke's subtle way of telling us a miracle took place. They went from catching nothing to catching something and to catch so much fish that it strained their nets to the point of breaking. The commentators are a little amusing to me at this point. Some argue that it is a miracle of omniscience. Jesus knew where the fish were going to be. Or others argue it's a miracle of omnipotence. He made the fish come to the nets. Which one is it, HB? Yes. <laughs> he who knows all knew where the fish would be, and yes, he who reigns over all drained the Sea of Galilee on the behalf of these unsuccessful fishermen. The Lord broke his nets and then began to sink their ships. 
Verse 7, they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats so that the boats began to sink. Verse 7 just affirms a real miracle took place. But I will concede this is a strange miracle. Why this miracle? Maybe the most obvious answer one would give is that Jesus rewarded Simon for letting him use his boat. Uh, The Lord indeed will not allow your your faithfulness to go unrewarded. If you take care of his business, he'll take care of your business. But there's a deeper truth here. In a real sense, Peter here was already a believer. This was not his first encounter with Christ. He had already been in Introduced to Christ. To some degree, he was already following Christ. He was there for the first miracle at Cana of Galilee when they believed on him after he turned water into wine. The Lord had visited his house already and healed his mother in law of a fever. But it seems, if I may, that at this stage, this early stage, following Jesus was just Simon's. Side hustle. He followed Jesus and went back home and fished some more. And the text will end with him forsaking everything and going into full-time discipleship. But before that takes place, I believe this miracle is Jesus making it clear to Peter, you're going back and forth, following me back to your business, following me back to your business. I want to make it clear that if you never fish again, I can take care of the fish problem. I am able to supply all your needs. Later in this chapter, there will be a miracle that is performed in response to faith. But here is a miracle in response to obedience. And I want to say to you, friends, if the Lord is calling you, he will take care of you. You worried about fish? He's able to break your nets and sink your ships. See the generosity of Jesus. Matthew Henry makes it clear. Christ's recompense for services done in his name are not just abundant, they are super abundant. If you do his will, don't worry about the fish. He is able to break your nets and sink your ships. No, I am not preaching prosperity theology. I am just saying amen to Ephesians 3.20. Now unto him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we could ask or think. Jesus uses available people. Jesus uses obedient people. Finally, Jesus uses submissive people. Obedience is action. Submission is attitude. Do you know that you can be rebelliously obedient? You can be disobediently obedient. They're riding in the car. The little boy starts jumping up and down in the back seat. Dad says, sit down. He said, no, I don't want to. Mom turns around, grabs the son by the ear and sits him down and says, I don't think you heard what your dad said. Either you sit down and buckle up now or you're going to be in big trouble. He gets the point. He sits down and buckles up. But under his breath, he says, I may be sitting down on the outside but I'm still standing up on the inside. (laughs) Do you know that our heart's attitude could be that way toward God? While we're going through the actions, going through the motions of obedient actions, but our heart is in rebellion against the Lord. The Lord uses not just obedient, but the submissive. What does it mean to be submissive quickly? The rest of the story, it begins with humble confession. When Simon saw this, he fell down at Jesus' knees in humility and reverence and contrition. And he says, depart from me. This is, the, this is the terror reflected in the Old Testament when a person has a personal and supernatural encounter with the living God. 
Peter here has a great sense of his own unworthiness. This, we, we celebrate the provision of the, the great catch of fish in, lo, of, in the text, but that's not what this text is about. The Lord was not trying to bless Peter's fishing business. He was revealing himself to Peter. Simon saw Jesus as he really was, and he saw himself as he truly was. I'm a sinful man. Friends, this is the starting place to use ability. I'm a sinful man. Of course, there are standards of character that are required for Christian service. But none of us are in the service of the Lord because we deserve it. We are all unworthy sinners. Loved ones, don't you leave here thinking that you are a first round lottery pick that the Lord has to pick up with a contract before some other team picks you up. All of us are bench riders who don't deserve to be on the team. But grace has found a place for us. The Lord can't use you until you recognize your own sinfulness and inability and find in Christ forgiveness and restoration and transformation. Kent Hughes says it well, the more we know of our sin, then the more we know of Jesus and the more we will run to him. Then there is a divine calling. Verse 9, he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken, and so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, do not be afraid. Guilt causes fear. Proverbs 28, 1 says, the wicked flee where no man pursues. Jesus says, do not be afraid. It's a cease and desist order grammatically. Stop being afraid. But he doesn't tell Peter not to fear because he disregards or downplays the significance of his sinfulness. He says instead to Peter, from now on, hallelujah. I know the sins of your past, Peter, but because of my grace, Your story doesn't end with the mistakes of the past. From now on means yesterday is not the end of the story. Grace can give you another chance. From now on, I know your past, but from now on, you will be catching men. Notice here that the Lord does not erase Peter's past. He recycles it. It says, you have been a fisherman. Now I will make you fishers of men. This is the calling to join Jesus in fishing for men. When commentator asked the question, what are all the fish in the ocean compared to the incomparable privilege of seeing one soul, one for Christ and for eternity? Finally, the text ends with total commitment. Verse 11 says, and when they had brought their Boats to land, they left everything to follow him. They left everything. Jesus is no longer his side hustle. They left everything. And would you note that he quit the fishing business on the day that he was most successful at the fishing business? He didn't wait till life had run afoul. Then he hit rock bottom and says, I I need to find, try Jesus now. No, no, no. On the most successful day, he follows Jesus. He doesn't try to get him, Jesus, involved in, you know, some of us would have used this moment to negotiate. I know, Jesus, you're an itinerant speaker and you travel to different cities, but, you know, if I could get you to come by this sea once a month and do this breaking nets thing... I'll split the profits with you. That's not what Peter says. He he left everything and followed Jesus. The old uh, Baptist evangelist Vance Havner said it took Peter moments to give up fishing. It took him a lifetime to give up himself. Amen. 
Remember when Jesus was betrayed in the garden, Peter followed at a distance, betrayed Jesus three times before the rooster crowed. But on resurrection morning, the message was to tell the disciples and Peter that he was alive and would meet them in Galilee. Somewhere after the resurrection, Peter decides, I'm going back fishing and take some of the disciples with him. John 21. Read it in the quiet chambers of your own praying ground. They fished all night and caught nothing. And the next morning, there is a shadowy figure at the beach that cries out, have you caught anything? And they said, nothing. And he says, throw your nets on the other side of the boat. And when they do, they receive a great catch of fish. This time, Peter doesn't wait for nets to break and ships to sink. He just dives in and swims to Jesus. Where amazingly, here's the mercy and tenderness and kindness of Jesus. Jesus cooked them breakfast. And around the breakfast table, he says, do you love me? Feed my sheep. Do you love me? Tend my sheep. Do you love me? Feed my sheep. And then says to Peter again, follow me. I close there. Friends, we are all at places where we have failed to be available and obedient and submissive. Thank God for a God of second chances. Today, make a fresh commitment to make whatever it is in your life available to him, to submit all of your plans to the authority of the Lordship of Jesus Christ, and to obey whatever his word commands so that he might use you for his glory and the good of others. Thank you for your word. We simply pray, help us to be doers of your word and not hearers only lest we deceive ourselves. Teach us to live in a posture of open availability, radical obedience, and humble submission to the praise of your glory. Amen.